Yeah, your work has a, um, uh, an amazing consistency about it, from even from your earlier work, certainly your early work in the in the 80s to what you're doing now. Although what you're doing now is in, involving um, more of photography and more of computer uh, imagery. Mm -hmm. um, but how did you uh, take the 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 paintings that were uh, peopled uh, uh, with figures in the in the 80s? And then in the 90s, I noticed that you started to do works where there were not any figures at all. Yeah. What, what, uh, what precipitated that decision? Uh, well, it really came out of the photography. I became more and more interested in how a landscape could have a resonance or a, um, um, I call it, using Rupert Murdrake's phrase, uh, 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 Sheldrake's, Rupert Sheldrake's face, uh, uh, morphological resonance, the idea that the landscape can have almost a spirit or a uh, kind of a ghost-like quality which uh, imbues it with a personality. Having done some photography at night in parks and glades and uh, different uh, strange uh, circumstances, I really wanted to start emancipating the light and having the light be the active agent. The light became the character. Uh, I'd been doing some paintings that had to do with rays and emanations of light, which uh, both struck me as being uh, symbolic of maybe divine revelation on the one hand, and also that I idea again of the paparazzi flash, a much more modern association with the flash, which can also have a, a un, 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 uneasy, can give one an uneasy feeling. You know, you think of explosions of like ionization, you know, some sort of strange uh, 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 chemical explosion or something. So these bursts of light in these landscapes was a, a kind of a critical heightening of this contradiction between the natural form, the tree, the lake, and these um, artificial, uh, aggressive artificial uh, lumin illuminations that. Uh, You'd see in these in, the, in these night scenes, the photographs would actually exaggerate that much more than the human eye would even see. In the uh, uh, late '80s uh, and early '90s, you did a series of very large paintings, um, paintings of uh, looks like uh, bay areas uh, across from the hotels or the uh, the balconies that where the the, the action of the, the figures are taking place. Um, how did you arrive at that uh, that sort of very monumental sweep in in the paintings, and uh, and those paintings also take on the, they're very large and they take a lot of time. How did you how did you find uh, first of all how did you how did you find the image and and how did you go about doing such a large complicated painting? I. Um of course, that language art was already in, in place, but I uh, had an exhibit in Rio in 1987. And uh, one night going up to the top of Sugarloaf, looking down over that whole amazing area of, of, of the water line, the coastline along Rio, I realized I had to up the ante and really start fully engaging myself in this idea of the sweep, the panorama of these types of towns, these types of cities that are coastal cities, could be Rio, could be Hong Kong, Los Angeles, any number of these places, Naples, which I visited shortly after, uh, to get that idea of almost the erogenous sexual aspect, the libidinal feeling we have for these kinds of sites, uh, these kinds of places, what they represent to us in, in Western culture as uh, sort of uh, the uh, the, the pleasure principle of capitalism, you know. Uh, there was a bit of irony. Uh, uh, there was definitely love-hate relationship for these things. I wasn't just embracing this stuff uh, as a purely enthusiastic person. I'm, I'm very interested in ecology. I know the cost of running these kinds of places, the kind of the destruction to the ecology that is necessitated in keeping these places going. But there's the love of that kind of spectacle you know, the love, which is, is, is somewhat banked by my, my negative feelings. Uh, and then that just idea of scale and how light is emanating at night. It's really what uh, mystics and religious thinkers, when they were describing heaven 
and different mystical sites had sort of envisioned, and here it was, technology I think is doing that, is trying to make all, the, all of history's dreams come true one way or another, and this, these were sort of the physical manifestations of these sort of dreamlike cities that had been described in different religious uh, scripture. So uh, there were a lot of different feelings having to do with uh, those kinds of places. And in terms of making them, yes, it, they got much more labor intensive. I, as I said before, I really felt I needed to immerse myself in these paintings. So in a painting like Capital or, or uh, Desire and Pursuit of the Whole or uh, Ghost of the Social, I was shrinking the figurative uh, element to maybe a lone figure floating in the middle of the, of the sky, uh, totally uh, encroached upon by this, this vast natural and artificial landscape. Uh, it was really my idea of the, of the modern sublime, or you could say the postmodern sublime in a way, this idea of the sublime being something which overarches the human, makes us feel small. Somehow we're, we're both threatened by it and thrilled by it. So it was really uh, an investigation of that idea of the sublime. The skies were informed by Frederick Church paintings and, and American uh, paintings of Caspar David Friedrich as well. That idea of the, the almost apocalyptic sky was a part of that idea of the city bursting at the seams, the lights almost explosive. So there was a whole aspect of romanticism that I was referencing in these paintings. And they are, as I said, very large paintings and, and mm -hmm. demanding to do. How do you uh, sustain your interest in a painting like that um, over the months or so that it takes to, to do? Uh, it's a bit of a mania, and uh, really the trick is to fit in the rest of your life. Uh, it's not so much working on the painting, it's, it's stopping work. And uh, if you are a binge worker like I am, I happen to like to work at a 10 or 12 hour interval. Uh, when do you stop, when do you eat, when do you have human, human relationships and so forth. So it wasn't the problem of sustaining interest, it was the, st the problem of, of dividing that with other requirements of life, like sleep. I'd listen to music. I'd listen to, uh, you know, uh, radio. New York uh, has a lot of talk shows and what have you. So there are ways to keep myself from going completely nuts. Do you have to work at uh, getting yourself prepared for a studio um, session? Um, it used to be a big problem. As I, as I got older, I could go in and start. Uh, younger uh, artists you have to go through all sorts of rituals and uh, you know spend five hours looking at magazines first or whatever anything to kill the time until the panic subsides a bit because there is panic before you start that it's you're not going to be up to it but uh, you know as I get older I can just go in and you know set up the table set up uh, the paints and, and, and get underway uh, again it was always a problem of stopping you know virtually I mean many times I would stop when I just couldn't stand up any longer I've quit working like that because it's not healthy. You do that for a few years and then you realize that you're, you're tearing your body up and it's not good for your mental health as well. And You back off from that kind of uh, work, but I still love those memories. Also, New York is a place where you can, you can work all night and then if you take a break for lunch at 3 in the morning, you go down the block and there's a very good restaurant open at 3 or 4 in the morning. You go in and you have a nice meal and maybe you work till dawn or whatever have you. So uh, it was an interesting period, yeah. And do you maintain that, that schedule now that you're dividing yourself be the time between New York and, and uh, the country or, or mm. Pennsylvania? It's odd because, you know, the work is about the night and it just made sense that work about the night, I did it at night. Uh, I'd started that because I, as a young artist, I felt embarrassed about being an artist during the day. I felt like people had real jobs during the day and how can I be an artist during the day? It's, you know. But at night, I was free. You know, there were no requirements. I could do something fully. And uh, so I worked for years and years at night. I was really a night bird. And uh, no longer I get up at 6, get up at 7 in the morning. I, I learned to put that part behind me. I'm married. I have a child. I have a teaching position. So there are still nights where I have to work all night and then make an 8 o'clock class, and it's not easy but uh, you do what you have to do.